Okay, I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? I realized that this webcam that I use can really, you can really see my cat's fur on my hat. So I'm going to have to think about this in the future. <laughs> or Tuna's just going to have to stop shedding. But how's everyone doing this Saturday morning? Thank you all for being here, by the way, for another Stock Unlock live stream. Um, Jake is not here for this live stream. He is in California at a wedding. So it's just going to be me today. And I basically am just going to be analyzing your guys' stocks, doing a stock talk. So if you guys have any tickers that you would like me to take a look at or any suggestions, please let me know in the chat and we can just get started right away. And we can start analyzing some stocks for, for all of you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I am going to get, I'm going to, ooh. Okay, yep, we got some tickers, let's go. Okay, I'm going to get my system set up here really quick. Good morning, Ali. Okay. So how I do this now is I put the live stream on my second monitor. So if you guys ever see me like looking over here, it's to see your comments because <laughs> I am going to share my screen now. Let's go. And I'm going to do this view today. All right. So we have some comments here. The first one is Aritzia. So Aritzia is a Canadian company, actually, but I believe... If I remember correctly, let me just make sure that I'm typing this correctly in the first place. Arit Z. Uh, I'm just not seeing it. There we go. Okay. So Aritzia is a Canadian retail company. They're like a clothing company, if I am remembering this correctly. I do not own this stock. I've never done a deep analysis on this stock. So let the chat please know um, if I am wrong here. But that's from my understanding. And also from my understanding, this company is expanding into the United States massively right now. And it sounds like their future growth is really projected to come from the United States. Yep. So Stock, Stock Auto says Aritzia competes with Lululemon, but it's just getting started in America. Yep. So this company has a large growth potential in the United States then. And that's really where they're going to be trying to capture growth. So... First off, let me take a look at how the stock has performed. So it looks like it IPO'd here in 2016. And then it really, it actually really didn't do that much. I'll zoom in for everyone. It really didn't do that much. Well, it was up like 10% from 2016 to 2019, you know, not like an amazing return there. It looks like it had a nice bump before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, you know, stock market crashed. But since then, this stock has been on a freaking rampage, up 370% from COVID lows to the beginning of 2022. Then it had a big correction here, 42%. Now it's back up 53%. Holy smoke. So this has been a very, very volatile stock. Um, so let's take a look at its insights. Insight score is decently good, 3.85. Financial health is all right. Um, growth is good. Revenue grew by 60%. Wow. Operating income, 61%. Net income, 70%. Um, free cash flow did decrease, though. That's interesting. Maybe they're doing some investments. Operating cash flow is decreasing as well, though. Interesting. Book value is growing, though. Tangible book, val book value is growing. So, some interesting things. Their profitability is a 3.0, so that's like pretty average. Free cash flow margins, 3%. Um, returns are very good, though. This business is investing its money quite well right now. ROIC of nearly 20%. That's pretty impressive. Okay, so let's take a look at their financials quick. Interesting. Okay, so revenue grew, then dropped, then massively grew. All-time high in the most recent quarter. So whatever happened here, this business is killing it now. Like their revenue growth clearly switched and now the company is growing massively. What is their cash flow doing though? Okay, so this is operating cash flow and it looks like it's kind of bouncing around 2016 to 2019. Did growth, it's super interesting. Okay, 
So we can see right here, their operating cash flow started spiking before COVID, which would also correlate to the company's share price spiking before COVID as well. So it looks like their profitability really started spiking and then COVID hit. With them being a retail business, I imagine their business did not perform that well, which we can see right here. But then out of nowhere, it started spiking massively again. So, but I don't know, man, like this is, this is like pretty volatile cash flows. Like overall, the revenue is growing and like overall, the trend is up. But the cash flow is like quite volatile. And every time I've looked at this business, that's kind of been my conclusion is I don't really like this volatile of cash flows. And that also, you can see here, like this has been a very volatile stock, <laughs> like holy smokes. So let me, let me see what the price of this business is right now. Let's go and take a look at the free form. Also, I apologize every time I stream, my internet gets super slow. So it looks like the company's probably doing some investments in future growth right now. So I'm going to look at the operating cash flow instead of the free cash flow. And the company is selling for 36 times, 37 times operating cash flow right now. Its average is 18. Okay, what's its price to earnings? Let's take a look at that. PE is 31. What about price to operating income? About 20. And is the operating income? Hmm. What is the PE doing again? Let's take a look. 30. They had this like ridiculous PE spike right here. Average 45. So, yeah, my the, I'll tell you why I don't want to own Aritzia personally. I don't know if the stock is a great one, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know if it's going to continue growing super well in the future or whatnot. Um, but I'll tell you why I don't want to own it. And I don't own it in my portfolio, even though it's a Canadian stock and it's been killing it recently. Um, main reason is because the cash flows are too volatile for me. I don't like I, the operating cash flow is just bouncing around so much. And I like more consistency in my personal portfolio. So I don't know what's going on there. I haven't dug into it for me to buy this stock. I would really want to go dive into why the operating cash flow is going around like that. The stock kind of tends like it or story. The stock kind of seems like it follows the operating cash flow as well. So yeah, I would just want to know what's going on there. Why is it so volatile? I haven't done that research. And then also, I think that it's kind of just expensive right now. Like, it doesn't really look like it's that cheap to me. So, yeah. That's why I don't own it. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not like super compelled to this stock. All right. Stock Auto says, the target is 20 to 25% growth for several years and the margin should improve as they're starting to ramp up their e-commerce sales. It's in the single digits now and they plan to make it 45% of their sales. Okay, so as Aritzia continues pursuing e-commerce and online sales that will most likely boost their margins, which I do agree with. And if they can achieve 20 to 25% growth for several years, then that's pretty insane. That that would change things. But as I said, I just haven't done like deep research into the stock. But at face value, those are the reasons why I would kind of be deterred away from it. All right. Stock Auto, again, Stock Auto is on fire today. <laughs> By the way, check out Stock Auto's YouTube channel. This guy makes great content. Hi, Daniel. Can you please check out Arista Networks? I think I actually saw you post about this on Twitter this morning, if I remember correctly. Arista Networks, Inc. I believe it's probably this one right here, Anet. Just hide your comment really quick. Okay. So this stock has been public since 2014, it looks like. And over this time, it's up 10x. So if we compare this to the SPY, this might have not been the one you were posting about on Twitter this morning, because I think you were posting about a small cap. This is not a small cap. So I think I might be wrong. Anyways, um, this stock is massively outperforming the SPY. It's up 872%, does not pay a dividend. It's a $41 billion company, so pretty large cap company. Um, let's take a look here. So the stock looks like it's kind of been volatile recently as well. It is coming back in a big way right now, though. All right, let's take a look here. Pretty freaking good insight score, 4.30. Okay, financial health is 4.6. That's very good. Current ratio is 4. Debt-free. Low intangibles. It's buying back shares, and it has more cash than total liabilities. Yeah, that is a very strong balance sheet. That is a very nice, that's that's a very nice balance sheet right there. 
growth. 3.75, revenue is increasing 42%, gross profit, operating income, net income, and operating cash flow is decreasing. Free cash flow is also decreasing, okay? Margins are pretty freaking good. Free cash flow margin, 16%, net margin, 30%, gross margin, 62%. So, I mean, this this stock at face value looks pretty good. I want to know why the, why the cash flows are going down, even operating cash flows going down. Um, what I also like to see here is the company is growing strong, like 42% revenue growth, while the shares are decreasing and it has low intangibles. So what this means is this business is growing organically. It is not doing acquisitions, or at least it's not diluting the shareholders to issue more shares to do acquisitions because the shares are going down and the intangibles are low. So th this kind of is a hint to me that this looks like organic growth, which is the best kind of growth. Wow. Okay. So revenue is growing super well. First off, what does this business even do? Engages in the development, marketing, and sale of cloud networking solutions. 3,000 employees, IPO 2014. The firm cloud networking solution consists of extensible operating system, a set of network applications, and it's gigabyte ethernet switching and routing platforms. Okay. So they are like a cloud networking solutions company. And with the cloud growing so much right now, that makes sense why they're growing as well. So let's take a look here. So what we can see, all right, we're going to go to the freeform tool. This will probably be a better way to represent this. Revenue. Okay. So. What I am noticing right now is their revenue is going up in a big way, but their operating cash flow is going down quite a bit. So their operating cash flow margin means that it is absolutely tanking right now. It went from 42% to 17%. I would want to know why this is. What is their operating income doing? So their operating income, though, is going nicely up. So... Yeah, I would want to know, what is their net income doing? Net income is also going up. Okay, so we can see that net income and operating cash flow are doing the exact opposite right now. Cash flow is going down, net income is going up. I would want to know why this is. Because to me, that probably means that the company is reporting some non-cash items towards net income. That's causing net in income to continue going up. And then I would just want to know, like, like, why is the operating cash flow not going up? Why are the why is the margin going down? Well, the revenue is absolutely skyrocketing. Because, you know, if this company can get with, with its revenue going up like this, if this company can, well, let's see. It had a 40% operating cash flow margin historically. So on $4 billion of revenue, 40% operating cash flow is $1.6 billion in operating cash flow. What's the market cap? Forty-two billion. Oof. Oof. Okay. So even, oops. So even if this company gets its forty percent operating cash flow margin back, then it would be selling for a twenty-six times price to operating cash flow. Which, with forty percent revenue growth and forty percent growth really across the business, honestly, like isn't that expensive? But the company's margin is currently going down. So. Yeah, that's a question that I would want answered. And then I would also look at, you know, what's this company's moat? How much runway for future growth does it have? Because it does look super attractive. I mean, when you take a look at the balance sheet and the revenue and everything, this company does look super attractive. So I would I would just have some questions there that I would want answers to. But honestly, like I'm going to add this one to my watch list because this does look super attractive. And if the management can answer those questions, then... I'll add it to my screener finds. Why not? And then I'll take a look at that later. Because yeah, again, if the management can answer those questions, then it looks pretty freaking attractive, man. That's actually a pretty, pretty, pretty nice find right there. Okay. Can you do GFL? Yes. Let's take a look at GFL. I've never taken a look at this one before. $11 billion company, IPO'd in 2020. What do they do? 
GFL Environmental engages in the provision of ecological solutions. The company is headquartered in Ontario, 18,000 employees. Wow. Company went IPO 2020. Okay, the firm is engaged in providing non-hazardous solid waste management. Okay, infrastructure and soil remediation services and liquid waste management services. Okay, so it's like waste management, it sounds like. I can already see the company is growing nicely. Take a look at their insights really quick. 2.9 average, okay. Dividend score average, financial health 1.6. Okay, what's going on here? Current ratio is below one has a lot of intangible assets. The shares are growing. Debt to EBITDA ratio is high. Negative tangible book value. Okay, so the balance sheet has some red flags here. Growth, revenue's growing. I mean, the growth looks great though. Revenue's growing, gross profit growing, operating income. What is cash flow doing? Cash flow is decreasing though, but operating cash flow is going up. And then the ROIC is not very high. Profitability also is not very high. Gross margin is 10%. Ooh. Ooh, I do not like that. Ooh, yeah, I don't know about this. So here's why. I'll super zoom for you. So the company has it's growing its revenue nicely, right? Revenue is growing. Everything looks great. It's like it's like tripled its revenue in four years. But the cost of revenue is growing just as quick as the revenue it looks like so when you take a look just for this company to produce its revenue it has to spend 5.7 billion dollars which means that the company is left with an, a gross profit of 700 million dollars which means this 708 million dollars right here is all the company has left to you know pay all of its operating expenses pay its employees pay its salaries pay for marketing pay for research and development and then also pay shareholders profits. So this is all that's left over after the company just generates its revenue, basically. And then we can see operating expenses, basically $700 million total operating expenses, which means that the operating income is $10 million. They also have a massive net interest expense right here. So that would probably be because the company has a large debt on its balance sheet. As we saw with the insights, the balance sheet is not the best. So I imagine they're, they got some debt. Their net interest expense is massive, $255 million. And remember, $700 million of gross profit, $700 million of operating expenses, then $256 million of interest expenses on their debt. So like, where is this money coming from? It's not coming from the company's organic profits. So red flag there. And then the net income would be negative. I would imagine that this company has had to dilute over the past years. It does look like the shares have grown here. This was when they did their IPO, though. So that would be why. They did their IPO. They raised some money through the IPO. So let's take a look at the balance sheet really quick. They do not have a large cash position. And they have a lot of current liabilities. What are their current assets? Yeah, so as we saw in the insights, more current liabilities than current assets. What is long-term debt doing? Okay, so when they IPO'd, it kind of looks like they tackled some of their long-term debt with the IPO money. But then since they IPO'd, um, their debt has been going up. Their debt has actually almost, it has actually doubled their long-term debt. And then we can see here, tangible book value is, so yeah, again, when they IPO'd, they used some of that money, it looks like, to tackle their debt. So their tangible book value increased. And then since they have been public, their tangible book value has continued going down. So that is not a great thing to see either. And their cash from operating activities, 977 million. Okay, so where is the cash going? $977 million comes into the business. 722 million goes to CapEx. 288 million goes to debt repayment. Common stock issued, okay. So yes, they did raise some money recently. And then free cash flow is quite low. Hmm. And how much is this business? $11 billion, hey? Hmm. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't think personally I would own this one. I think its margins are just way too thin. Like, yeah, the revenue is growing, but with a 10% gross margin, 
you don't really have a lot of profit potential for shareholders. Let's see if that's been improving. Like, what is happening here? Trailing 12 months. So gross margin has been slightly improving, but like it's nothing major. So yeah, I just don't like how little or how low the margins are. And I don't like this company's balance sheet. They're taking on a lot of debt, tangible book values going down. Interest payments are very high. Interest payments are more than the net income of the business and cash flow. So yeah, I think there's just a lot of red flags here for me and low margins. So I, I don't think I like this one. Okay, we got a good question here. This is about Magnet Forensics. Magnet Forensics is a stock that I own personally. Full disclosure there. And this stock has been annoying me, man. So this company IPO'd here in 2021. I've, I've talked about this one before on the channel. But it ran massively in 2021. Then it saw this huge, basically a crash. It fell 85%. And I, you know, I looked like a freaking market timer or something but honestly this was just luck because i bought magnet forensics right down here literally at 1620 is where i bought my first shares right there at the bottom i did not time that i did not mean to time that i didn't know what the stock was going to do i just thought it was cheap and since i bought magnet it is now up 150 percent over the past five months and it just keeps going higher which is annoying me because i want to buy more of this i think it's a great company but now i think that it's getting on the expensive end but anyways Magnet Forensics, how they're different from all of the other cybersecurity stocks is because if you take a look at CrowdStrike, for example, CrowdStrike tries to prevent security breaches um, over the cloud and everything like that. So they are a cybersecurity company that is dedicated to preventing cyber attacks. Magnet Forensics is on the other side of the, of the page they respond to cyber attacks. So once the cyber attack or the cyber crime has been committed, once it's done, then Magnet Forensics comes in and they're like, okay, let's break down the cyber attack. Let's break down the cyber crime. Let's figure out who did it. Let's gather all of the information. And they can consolidate information from like hundreds of different devices, hundreds of different platforms, put it all together. And then their system analyzes the data and can make connections very rapidly. I was reading reports from, um, I, I believe it was a police, like the National Police Force in the United Kingdom, and they were saying that Magnet Forensics is saving them dozens of hours a week. And also, it's it's letting, well, from my understanding, the police force right now doesn't have a lot of cyber crime experts. And what Magnet Forensics basically does is allows anyone to turn into a cyber crime expert. So they're... They're turning their regular, their regular police force into basically cybersecurity wizards. And uh, they're saving a lot of time. So this business, I've also noticed that they don't have a lot of competition. Like their only other competition that I've been able to find is this company, Calibrite. Why can I not spell this? Calibrite. I don't know why. CLBT. Celebrate. Sorry. Celebrate. So this is Magnet Forensics competition right here. Um, this company actually produces more revenue than Magnet, but they're not growing nearly as quickly. And they're not nearly as profitable. Sorry, their margins are lower. So basically Magnet is taking a lot of market share from this company because I think Magnet is a better business and it has a better product. And this company is growing much slower than Magnet now and has lower margins. So the fact that Magnet also has higher margins kind of tells me that they have a competitive advantage over this company. They're just more efficient and they're more profitable. So that's why I initially chose Magnet. I was looking into both of these companies, but I chose Magnet and so far it has turned out to be, turned out to be the right choice. And this company is incredible. So that's, that's where Magnet comes in when, you, when you're thinking about the whole cybersecurity space. Okay. Okay, we got some. Got some questions over here. Sorry, I'm just catching up on all the comments. Okay, yeah, got it.
Okay, DBX. Exponential Investing says, can you take a look at DBX? Yeah, um, because I've actually wanted to take a look at this one for a while. So DBX is a stock that I've talked about on my main YouTube channel. And I've like, I have this stock on one of my watch lists. And what I've noticed is like, it just has not been going below $20. Like the market for months, like for about seven months now, the stock has not gone below $20. And it's just been bouncing around here. And I'm like, what is happening with this business? So let's take a look, actually, because I have not updated myself. Okay, so Dropbox has some nice revenue growth. Their most recent quarter was an all-time high for revenue. That's nice to see. Company has a good gross profit. Let's actually take a look at their insights really quick. 3.62, not bad. Financial health, all right. Current ratio above one. Shares are decreasing by 9% over the past year. Debt to EBITDA is three, though. So some debt on the balance sheet for sure. Some long-term debt. Growth is average. Revenue is grown by 9%. Gross profit growing. Operating income growing. Cash flow is growing. I love that. Gross margin is 80%. Yeah, so this is a pretty profitable business. Yeah, 32% free cash flow margin. ROIC is very high. So let's take a look at the cash flow. Cash flow is at an all-time high right now. But this business is buying back a lot of shares. So I'll zoom in here. So they had, oops, they had $765 million enter the business in the past year organically. Their CapEx is very low. I love that. So that means they got a lot of free cash flow. And then the question is, what are they doing with this free cash flow? Well, they're paying off debt. $127 million went to debt. They also bought back a billion dollars worth of shares. But we can see right here that they bought back more shares than they produced in free cash flow. So let me go take a look at the balance sheet. Let's take a look at their long-term debt. So they took on debt, a lot of debt. They took on 1.3 billion dollars of debt in 2020. However, they have been slowly tackling it as we saw but they did take on some debt shareholder equity is negative That's something to note and you can see it went negative when they took on their debt and then tangible book value is also negative so that's something to definitely note so they have more liabilities than tangible assets so basically for Dropbox, they just like don't have the best balance sheet in the world but they are a very profitable business and i don't think they're going to be in trouble financially just because like this company is a free cash flow machine. It has like no CapEx. It's got a lot of cash coming into it. And it's using basically all of its cash flow and more to buy back shares right now. So it's got a price to free cash flow of 11.49, free cash flow yield of 8.7. And they're basically returning all of this cash back to their shareholders. So to me, this looks like a pretty slow growing business. That's pretty solid. Um. And it's kind of priced like it's not growing. So I, I think that it's probably selling around fair value in my own opinion right now. Let's take a look. What was the market value to Dropbox historically? And we're going to use price to free cash flow because it's a very profitable business. Wow. Okay. So Dropbox was selling for a price to free cash flow of 44 in 2018. And it's just been coming down massively. It's at 11.7 now. So we can see the average over the past, well, we got to go to 2018. So we can see the average over the past four years has been 21. It's selling at like half of its average. So, which means it's free cash flow yield was, yeah, about 8%, right? So to me, I think Dropbox is like not a growth investment. I don't think that the revenue and the free cash flows are going to grow like super well in the future. But... It does produce a lot of cash flow and it does return that cash to shareholders through buybacks. Um, well, I don't own the stock. I just don't think that it's like compelling enough for me to own it. Like if if the free cash flow yield was like 15%, then I would consider this one a lot more. But with an 8% free cash flow margin and not really growing, it's kind of like, or sorry, not margin, um, yield, free cash flow yield. It's kind of like, eh. 
but I'll show you why. We have HPQ right here. This is a Warren Buffett stock, by the way. So HPQ is a business where I believe the 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 cash flows are not really growing as well. It's like a very slow growing business. So yeah, since about 2017, the operating cash flow has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 1.58. So it's not really like growing, you know, that much either. But if we take a look at this company's free cash flow yield, it's 12%. And it even got up to 20% at one point. And HPQ returns a ton of money back to their shareholders. Like all of this money goes back to shareholders through dividends and through buybacks. If we actually take a look at this company's shares outstanding, shares outstanding since 2017 have declined at a 10% annual rate. And I believe in recent years, it's been even more. So from 2020, they bought back 16% of their shares on an annual basis. And their share count has declined by 40%. So this company, like this is what I mean. This company is also a company that's not really growing that quickly, but it has a much higher free cash flow yield, which means that it's just returning a lot more cash to its shareholders. And um, yeah, so for Dropbox, it's not really growing that quickly. So I think that this could be higher for me personally. Before I get interested, I would like to see this higher. PDS says, I own HPQ, buying back extremely cheap shares. Yep, I agree. HPQ, like I think Warren Buffett bought the stock, Berkshire Hathaway bought the stock just because of how much freaking cash it generates. Like again, free cash flow yield of 12%. So basically this business doesn't even need to grow its cash flows at all on the price today for it to give shareholders over 10% annually, which is better than the SPY has returned, right? So when you're taking a look at the actual business of HPQ and how much money the business can return to you, it's 12% right now. So again, as long as they can maintain their free cash flow like this, then they can just continue buying back shares, increasing their dividend and giving shareholders a 12% return. So I actually made a video on the stock when Berkshire bought it and broke down why I thought they were buying it. And I think Buffett was just buying it because it's like it just generates so much cash flow. And they're giving all of that cash flow back to shareholders. Okay, VJ says, most large enterprises are moving to OneDrive due to cheaper costs. So yeah, that would probably affect Dropbox's business right here. Oh, you have an earlier comment. My only issue with Dropbox is its competition with Microsoft's OneDrive, which comes in its office suite of products. In the last five to six years, OneDrive has caught up a lot with DBX features. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, I just think there's a lot of free options out there. Personally, I use Google Drive, and I've had no problems with Google Drive. And I, I used to use Dropbox, by the way. When I had my photography business, I used to use Dropbox every single day. But now I've moved everything over to OneDrive because I just love Google. <laughs> So definitely consider the competition there as well. PDS says, my thesis for HPQ is because it's a stable, undervalued legacy tech. I will sit and wait, collect and reinvest my dividend while they buy back shares. We'll drive up EPS and the stock for over five to 10 years. Yeah. And I mean, I think that is exactly Warren Buffett's thesis on HPQ as well, is it's just like a stable business that's going to continue generating and producing a ton of free cash flow and giving that back to shareholders. Like if HPQ wanted to, right? If they wanted to, they could stop buying back shares and increase the dividend right now to 12% organically. And then and then the shares would have a 12 per, oops, and then the shares would have a 12% dividend yield. And they could do that if they wanted to, which would also probably attract a lot of attention. But yeah, I mean, solid thesis on HPQ in my opinion. They got great laptops. Okay, let's take a look at some more stocks. WSM, I'm seeing a couple of comments about WSM. All right. Williams Sonoma. Okay, so one thing that my brain is noticing right now is this stock did not handle the financial crisis very well. It dropped 82% during it. So it's a retail business. Okay, what do they do? 
engages in the retailing of home products. The company is headquartered in San Francisco, 12,000 employees. William Sonoma Home, Rejuvenation, which markets through e-commerce websites. Okay. Okay, so this is like a home. One of their competitors is Bed Bath & Beyond, and RH. So this sounds like a home retailing business, which would make sense why it did not handle the last recession very well. Let's see if that is in the fundamentals, though. Because sometimes stocks just drop way more than the fundamentals. Yeah, so in 2008, their revenue dropped about 30%. And this is so funny to me. So look, the revenue drops 30%, but their stock drops 80%. Like, the market can overreact, it looks like. So revenue dropped. Well, what did their free cash flow do, actually? Or their operating cash flow during the last... Wow, it didn't even freaking drop, really? Well, it did. Dropped by about 40%, but came back very nicely. Yeah. So it actually handled the last recession pretty well. So if we do enter another recession, it's probably going to see some decline, but it should probably be okay. It's also a pretty massive business. Let's take a look at their insights. 3.39 average score. Dividends are pretty good. They're growing the dividends. On a five-year basis, they've grown at 15% a year. Payout ratios are low. Love to see that. Financial health, 4.33. Shares have decreased by 10%. Wow. So they're buying back a lot of shares. Okay. Revenue is growing. Average, average. Operating income growing. Operating cash flow decreasing, though. Book value decreasing. Free cash flow decreasing. Profitability average. Free cash flow margin 10%. And okay. So balance sheet looks decent. Cash flow. Okay, so they produced 1.2 billion in cash from operating activities. That's how much money came into the business. $320 million in CapEx, which means about 800 million in free cash flow. So just like Dropbox, well, actually they're paying dividends on top of that. So, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they have free cash flow of 851 million right here, right? They pay a dividend. So 851 million minus a dividend of 217 million equals 634 million dollars left after paying the dividend. And they bought back 1.1 billion dollars worth of shares. So they bought back a lot of shares, much more than they actually generated in free cash flow. So then the question is, well, where did that cash come from? Um, it could have just come from the balance sheet if they have a strong cash position. They could have just used more cash, which it looks like they did because their cash dropped massively here, dropped from $850 million down to $113 million. So, man, did they pull a Bed Bath & Beyond? What is their debt done? They have no long-term debt, really. Wow. Liabilities have been stable. Assets, asset stable. Shareholder equity has kind of been staying stable. Okay. So yeah, what it looks like happened to me, because as we just saw in the cash flow statement, this business, um, they're buying back a lot of shares, more shares than they actually produce in cash flow, which means that their cash position, because they didn't raise debt, it doesn't look like, and they didn't issue shares. So where that cash came from looks like it came from the balance sheet. And as we can see right here, the cash position dropped down to 113 million. Now this business does generate a lot of cash flow, so that's probably fine, but they did drop their cash position dramatically to buy back shares. And you know, they got a free cash flow yield of 10% right now. So maybe that was a good call. They're getting a good yield on that, but just know that the company's balance sheet cash position like was wiped out through buying back shares. Now, why this can be an issue is because, was it BBBY? It was. Okay, so if we go over to Bed Bath & Beyond, this is, Bed Bath & Beyond is an issue, okay? So check this out. In the trailing 12 months, they have lost $611 million, $611 million in operating cash flow, okay? So this business is actually losing money. And then what they did 
is they were buying back hundreds of millions. They bought back $600 million worth of shares in Q4 in the trailing 12 months of Q4. So basically in 2021, they bought back $600 million worth of shares and they were buying back hundreds of millions of dollars worth of shares while the company was losing money. And their cash position, like, this is what I mean. Did the WSM pull a Bed Bath & Beyond? When I said that, I meant, did they pull a Bed Bath & Beyond where they literally spent all of their money on share buybacks while the company was also losing money? So WSM kind of pulled the Bed Bath & Beyond, but the only difference is WSM is actually a profitable business. So they didn't like put themselves in any financial danger, in my opinion, by doing that. Whereas Bed Bath & Beyond did. They pulled a super stupid move and they they like self-inflicted, bankrupted the company through buying back their own shares while they're losing money. And this is the result. The stock is down 95%. Absolutely awful management of capital. Like ridiculous. So I am happy to see that WSM is in a much better position. It's a much better company. And um it's got a nice free cash flow yield. So I would take a look at the long-term trend. What's going on here? Because I believe the business was growing over the long-term. Okay. So they consistently buy back shares. Wow, look, like, look at this. From 2004, their shares have dropped from 117 million down to 66 million. So they have like cut their shares in half over the past 18, 18 years. Over the past decade, they have cut their shares by 34%. Has their dividend been growing too? Yeah, it's grown by, as we saw, 15%. Revenue has been growing as well. Honestly, this is pretty interesting. And it's interesting because it's also not expensive. Price to free cash flow is nine. And it's like still kind of growing. So my, my one concern in my brain, I don't know if this is right or not, but the one question that I would ask myself when I'm looking into this business is if we do enter an economic downturn, is there a chance businesses revenue and cash flow will go down like the cash flow right now is going down but that could be due to capex but just like what happened here in 2008 where the revenue dropped could this happen again if we do enter a downturn and if it does what will happen to the company's stock price what happened last time we entered a recession in 2008, the price to free cash flow went down to seven, which is like slightly lower than where it is today. So who knows? It does look interesting. This honestly does look like an interesting stock. It's a cash flow machine. It's returning a lot of cash back to shareholders. Um, balance sheet's pretty good. And yeah, honestly looks pretty decent. I'm not seeing a lot of red flags with this one, to be honest. Dell is growing faster than HPQ. Interesting. By the way, seriously, you guys got to go follow Stock Auto. Like, even on Twitter, Stock Auto, I'm going to give you a shout out right now because you post charts on Twitter about Meta and Google and just a bunch of different tech businesses that I love. I don't know where you're getting all of your research, but you are on top of it. Like, I love following you. I share them in my own personal Discord all the time. I'm like, look what Stock Auto shared today. Like, Great work. Okay. Um, I'm going to Airbnb and Meta. Okay. So Jake has talked about Airbnb a lot recently because Jake has been buying Airbnb. He is very bullish on this business. I have not bought any Airbnb. Um, so I will not talk about Airbnb again, but I will talk about Meta. Because I own Meta. Also, Meta was the first stock on Stock Unlock to be followed by over 1,000 people, which is cool. And it's still going up. That's awesome. Love to see it. But yeah, Meta is a very, very, very interesting business right now. So this stock, 
we all know what Meta is, right? They own Facebook. They're going into the metaverse and everything. Stock was up 2,000% from 2012 to 2021, over nine years. Now it has absolutely crashed. The reason Meta has crashed is because their cash flows are starting to come down. And the company is investing so much freaking money into the metaverse. And the reality is no one knows if the metaverse is going to play out. I don't know if the metaverse is going to play out. So with the company going all in on the metaverse, personally, I think that it's a little bit more speculative because we don't know if the like tens of billions of dollars that Zuck is spending is actually going to produce returns for shareholders later on in the future. I think it will, but I don't know if it will. So for me, that's why Meta right now is a smaller position in my portfolio. I have been buying like nibbling because I like dollar cost average in my portfolio. And I like to buy stocks every month or honestly, like every two weeks, whenever I get paid, I pay my bills and then I go and deposit money into my, my investing accounts. But I've been buying Google, Amazon, Magnet. Well, I was buying Magnet, not anymore, but I've been buying stocks like that over Meta. And then Meta takes like a very small amount of my DCA because I do think that it is a little bit more speculative right now. But if this company gets back its previous cash flow, then it is ridiculously cheap. So I'll show you. Let's take a look at their free cash flow margin. Because this is what's happening to the business right now. They're investing so much money. Like Meta used to have a 50% free cash flow margin, which is like doesn't even make sense. And then it's tanked all the way down here to 22%. And in the most recent quarter, it's been 1%, right? So basically the company's free cash flow is gone. It's like no longer producing profits. But the company's revenue is, well, it's starting to come down, but it's still remaining quite high. And I think that Meta's revenue over the long term is going to continue growing. I think they're going through a period of slower growth right now. They're probably going to be a slower growth company in the future. But I do think that over the long term, this trend is going to continue up. So basically, if Meta can get, you know, even a 30% free cash flow margin back in the future. Let's not even go back to 50%. That was insane. Let's say they're going back to 30% free cash flow on $120 billion of revenue. Multiply that by 0.3. I should be able to do this in my head. $36 billion of free cash flow. On a market cap now, on a market cap of $319 billion. So $320, let's call it divided by $36 billion in annual free cash flow is a price to free cash flow of 8.9, which is very, very low for Meta, a business that in my opinion is going to grow over the decades. And if we divide 100 by 8.9, that is a free cash flow yield of probably 11% right there. So basically, if Meta can even get back 30% free cash flow margins, which is well below the company's historical, you know, margins, um, then I think it's like ridiculously cheap, ridiculously cheap. So that's why I've been buying it. But again, I don't know if all these investments are going to pay off. I don't know for sure if that free cash flow margin is going to come back and when it will. So that is why I am being a little bit more careful with Meta right now. And it, I'm not letting it make up a huge position. But man, that dip right here, when it was like $80 a share, that was... That was really cheap for Meta, especially when you consider this company's financial position. Like it has total cash of $41 billion. And the total liabilities here, $54 billion. So it almost had more cash than total liabilities. Like it's, it's one of the best balance sheets I've seen. Google's is probably better, but Meta's still got a very nice balance sheet. It's not going out of business. It's not going anywhere. I think it's going to continue growing. And... We'll see what happens. That's basically my opinion on it. Okay, let's take a look at INCR. I've never heard about this business. Um, cannabis market in Europe. Really? Intercure. Okay, so I don't know what happened right here, but this stock spiked 462% out of nowhere. That would be something to look into. Since then, it has come down. It's a $219 million company. <clears throat> so a small cap. 
Has no free cash flow. Has earnings, though. Weird. Revenue looks like it's been growing. Insight score 3.25. All right, let's take a look. So apparently analysts are very bullish on this. Has a cash runway of 220 months. So nine years of cash. Current ratio is 1.6. Intangibles, shares have grown by 10%. So it did dilute. Revenues increased by 100%. Gross profit 100%. Operating cash flows decreased though. Free cash flows decreased. Profitability is not there though. So it's losing money. Hmm. Wow, that is some serious revenue growth, though. Okay, revenue is growing. So they have operating income, but they do not have cash flow. Interesting. Really? Okay, so their operating cash flow has come down. And then their investments in CapEx are higher. The company's taking on debt. They're consistently taking on debt. They issued a lot of shares back here. And free cash flow in the trailing 12 months has been negative. So what is their balance sheet like? 215 of cash. And their cash is remaining stable. But they're also taking on debt every quarter. So keep that in mind. Um, goodwill. Liabilities got to be growing. Yep, because they're taking on debt every quarter. Current debt growing. Long-term debt. Okay, so they took on current debt recently, not long-term debt. And their liability is growing. Shareholder equity then. Interesting. How is their equity growing? Goodwill's growing. Property, plant, and equipment growing. Receivables growing. Okay, so the receivables are really growing. That's what's, that's what's up. And book value is growing. So what are their shares outstanding doing? Because they didn't raise money recently. But they are... I don't know what's happened here. I would really take a look into what happened here. Okay, this is interesting. But I also think it's kind of speculative. Like... I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know like what this business's margins are going to look like in the future. It's not generating profits right now. And I mean, a business has to generate profits, right? So basically, if this business does not generate profits at some point in the future, then it's just going to continue raising debt and burning through debt, which is what we saw. However, its receivables are growing a lot. And receivables is like money owed to the business essentially for services. So on the balance sheet here, we can see the receivables are going up. So this is basically like future money coming into the business that other businesses owe them. So I don't know, like it looks interesting, but more on the speculative end, in my opinion. And I'm going to add this one to my watch list because I will keep track on the stock to see if its fundamentals improve. But like right now, it looks like the company's kind of living off debt in the meantime. And I don't love that. Um, I need a new watch list. Boom, new watch list. Okay. Yeah, thanks for bringing this one up. It's interesting. I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, I saw some for Signature Bank. Yeah, this was a stock... I think that's SGNY. Wrong. Signature SBNY. Ah. Okay, this one has a very high insight score. And it's been growing super well. So Signature Bank engages in the provision of commercial banking. The company is headquartered in New York, 1,800 employees, IPO 2004. So they do commercial banking and specialty finance. The commercial banking, seg commercial banking segment consists of commercial real estate lending, commercial and industrial lending, fund banking, venture banking, 
and other commercial deposits gathering activities. Specialty finance segment consists of financing and leasing products, including equipment, transport, commercial marine, and a bunch of other things. Okay, so this bank seems like it has grown ridiculously quickly, and it has. If you take a look at the trailing 12 months revenue growth, like that is insane growth. And what's also insane is back here in 2007 and 2008, this bank was not really affected at all. It's trailing 12 months revenue dropped by 8% and then it just continued growing. So it's been during the last recession, it was really resilient and I like to see that. It also generates basically all of its revenue from interest income, not non-interest income. Earnings have also been growing a little bit more shaky than the revenue. Like in 2018, looks like they had some some issues here. But overall, I mean, their net income exploded in 2020. And it's remaining high. Shares outstanding have been growing slightly. Um, EPS, though, has been growing nicely. So even though the shares have been diluted a little bit, um, EPS is still grown. So what about their deposits? Okay, so their deposits dropped last quarter. Interesting. But their deposits exploded in 2021. What is their book value? Book value dropped last quarter. It's $8 billion in book value. So if we go to metrics, we should be able to see book value per share. $128 book value per share. So it's selling slightly above book value. What are insiders doing? Apparently nothing. Okay, dividends. Dividend has not grown. Payout ratio is low. Financial health is good. Growth is really good. Really strong growth. Profitability. So, I mean, it seems decent. And then if we go to the freeform tool, it's got a PE of seven right now. For that growth, that's a pretty low PE ratio. Like that's lower than probably JP Morgan. Got to be lower than JP Morgan. Yeah, JP Morgan's PE right now is 10.7. So it's quite significantly below JP Morgan. It's historically been below JP Morgan as well. Oh, wait, no, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. It's actually been more expensive historically. So yeah, we can see Signature Bank's PE is well below JP Morgan. It's also well below its averages. Its average has been 18 over the past, well, let's go to 2012. It's been, yeah, 18 over the past decade, 7.3 right now. So it's well below its averages. And if we're comparing this to JP Morgan right now, we can see that Signature Bank has grown its revenue at 16% a year versus JP Morgan's two. And what about the net income? Net income has grown at 22% a year versus JP Morgan seven. And this one is cheaper right now. So what it looks like to me is the market is expecting Signature Bank's fundamentals to decline in the future. And it's pricing the stock like its fundamentals are going to decline. So Signature Bank saw this like massive spike to fundamentals here. Absolutely massive. And the market now is pricing the stock, in my opinion, like this boom is going to reverse and something is going to cause the fundamentals to come down. And I would look into why the market is pricing it like this. Like what do analysts think for the stock? So analysts apparently think that the revenue is going to continue growing and the EPS is going to continue growing, just not as quickly. Compounded annual growth rate of 6%, compounded annual growth rate of 2%. Analysts are very bullish on the stock though. So I don't know why it's so cheap. I would, tr I would really try to figure out why it looks so cheap though. Like what, what is, like what are, we got to be missing something here. And if we're not missing something and this stock is actually going to continue growing in the future, then it looks really cheap right now. So it's interesting. It's already on one of my watch lists. It's a screener find. I'm going to add it to my interesting stocks too. It's interesting. Because also take a look at this. I mean, back in 2015, it was at 160 ish dollars a share. It's at 136 now. 
So it's lost. It's lost. What is that? Seven years of gains. And over the past seven years, I mean, the net income has grown at 21% a year over the past seven years, but the stock price, you can see the stock price is basically back to where it was. So the stock and the fundamentals right now are moving in the wrong direction. So that's also why I'm saying that the market is pricing it as if the fundamentals are going to come down because the stock has come down in a massive way. So yeah, I would look into why this is, why does the stock, why are the stock and the fundamentals going the totally opposite direction? Because maybe the market is seeing something and that's, that's what I would look into. Yeah. Emmanuel says probably the bank portfolio is risky. Yeah, I would agree. I would take into where their loans are, who are their loans with. I did see that they do some venture banking down here. Yeah, venture banking. So who knows? Maybe they did a ton of venture banking last year and like some very speculative companies. Maybe that made up a large portion of their deposit and net income growth. Maybe these venture stocks or venture companies are unprofitable, losing money, maybe going under. Who knows? I'm totally speculating right now, but like that is a possibility. And I definitely agree. Maybe the portfolio is risky. So I would definitely take a look into that more. And thank you for this comment, by the way. But um, I believe we're at just over an hour. Unfortunately, I cannot stay longer today. I have plans to go see my sister today, actually. Um, she's hosting. She started her own floral business, and I'm going to support her floral business. She's having a like a, a floral event today. So I invited a bunch of my friends, me and my girlfriend are going, my girlfriend's family is going to show up. And so unfortunately today I got to get off at the actual hour. I cannot stay longer and do like an hour and a half live stream today. So I apologize about that, but thank you everyone so much for tuning in to today's stock talk. Jake should be here next week as well. He should be back from his wedding. So next week we should be doing the stock talk live stream at the same time, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, or sorry, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. It's 9.30 my time. <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We truly do appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoyed the live stream today and make sure to tune in next week as well. Also, last week, this last week, we released our screener. You guys, if you have not checked out the screener, you should definitely check out the screener. I made a video tutorial on the channel like two days ago, I think. Check out that tutorial video on how to use the screener because this screener is freaking awesome, man. I love this screener. It is, it's honestly the only screener I use now. And the reason I love it so much is because you can, you know, filter out whatever you want. You can take a look. Like for me, I like to take a look at the TSX. I should have done some more screeners in this video because I honestly love this screener, even though I'm totally messing this up right now. TSX, boom. So I like to take a look at TSX stocks. I also don't like oil companies, though, so I want to remove energy. Get out of here. Okay, so then I can take a look at all these stocks, right? And then we rank them based on our insight score. So right away, I can see the, the highest rated stocks on stock on a log, and I can avoid all of the bad companies with the low insight scores. So when I'm looking for new investments, I don't even have to look at these personally because these are probably stocks with, you know, bad financials. Let's take a look. Growth is bad. Financial health is decent, but growth is bad. This company's financials, fundamentals are declining. Probably not a stock I want to invest in. Profitability also sucks. You know, losing money. So on our screener, we sort these based on those insight scores that we, we grade stocks with, right? So it helps me find stocks to actually research, and I don't have to look at all the bad companies with the low insight scores or anything like that. So it's a super awesome screener, and it speeds up the the, the process of finding high quality stocks massively. So again, if you guys have not checked this out, seriously, I would go check out the screener. I absolutely loved this screener. And we've already got we've already got a lot of um a lot of suggestions and requests for new filters that we're gonna add. We are gonna add a lot more filters. Like the way that we do it here at Stock Unlock, okay, is we release a new feature and then we let everyone go and play with it. And then we receive a ton of feedback from the users and then we just continue building it. So we have a document that we're building of new filters that we're going to be adding and we're going to be adding new over time. Like I can already see Nick added ROCE and ROYC. These were not here like 
three days ago. So he's already working. He's already adding in more filters. So if you guys want new filters in the screener, let us know. Um, email us at support at stock on a lock and we'll build this. Whatever, whatever filters you guys want, we'll build it. We're going to be adding a debt free filter, I believe. Um, so we can screen stocks that have no debt. Awesome. And um, yeah, it's just going to continue getting better. And thank you guys so much for all of your feedback on the screener. But yeah, Ali, the filtering is insane. I agree. Oh, I love this screener so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, VJ. Okay, we got a comment about Signature Bank. Belair says, the reason for the spike in deposits is a lot of people putting cash in for crypto deposits. Now they are taking those deposits out since crypto is declining. Makes sense. Thank you for that comment. Also says, I know a lot about Signature Bank as I follow banks. They hold a lot of money in different crypto wallets. Got it. Yeah, so I don't like that personally. Thank you for sharing that comment. Really appreciate that. But all right, I got to go, guys. I don't want to be late for my sister's event. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for, you know, being here. We really appreciate it. And make sure to check out our new screener. It's awesome. And yeah, cannot thank you guys enough for being here. And I will see you all next week for next week's stock talk. Have a great week, everyone. Have a great weekend. And I will see you next week.